Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see somewhere behind me, it's Tropical Houseplants. So today is going to be another continuation of the plant review series, and by popular demand, because I did push this out as a poll on Instagram, we are doing the Philodendron Painted Lady today, which is very, very cool, and in my opinion, a massively underrated houseplant, just purely because it doesn't translate as well on photos or on video. I will do my best in this video to get some nice, interesting close-ups so you can kind of see, but this is definitely one of those plants, 100%, that if you see it in person, you will get what the hype is all about. Now, for the people that have been here for a while, you know that you can go to the bottom and see about which chapter you want to jump out to, and you can choose and watch your favorite section. For the new people that are now joining, welcome. Welcome to the madhouse that is this plant review series. But <laughs> essentially, some ground rules, really. With these reviews, they are always going to be biased to me, my experience with my plant in my environment, in my location, which is in the UK, I grow in a conservatory and whatever that might mean as well. So this might be different to what you're experiencing. But the whole point of creating this plant review series is because as far as I'm aware, there's nothing like this out there at the moment. And it's a nice place for people to go and share their experiences on how they've cared for the plants, any challenges, any big wins that they may have had as well, just because we can all learn from it essentially. And yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. Let's dive into the first topic. Right, for the background of this plant, I thought I would lift it up. Whether or not I'm going to be lifting this plant up for the majority of the video, I don't know, because I will give you a quick look. And again, the people that have watched the conservatory tour know why I'm looking up. But this is the entirety of my mother plants of this philodendron painted lady. I will bring it back in, but I think throughout this video, I'll probably cut to some video roll, just so you can kind of see up and close what I'm talking about. I might put this down so we can talk a bit more about the background, but for the eagle-eyed amongst you, and I don't know whether or not you can notice it, I think you can, uh, support sticks for the win for this one. Right, now that I've put that down, because not only is it large and cumbersome and just difficult to work around, it is very heavy as well at the same time, even if it is in a net pot, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So the background with this plant, if I'm not mistaken, I think I actually got this from a local plant store, and that will kind of harken into the availability of this plant in a further section down in the review. But it was good because, again, and this is what I said in the very beginning, I never really quite got the hype of this plant. I really never did because the pictures weren't great, the videos weren't great, like I said. But I'm just like, okay, it's okay. I'm, uh, it's not setting my world on fire. So I went to this plant store and saw this plant and I instantly changed my opinion on it. Because what you'll kind of notice for the first, the first thing that basically you'll notice when you look at this plant is the leaves. And it's obviously why it gets its name, the Painted Lady, because you will get a leaf that has got green sections, it's got cream sections, it's also got some pink blushing when it's a new leaf, but it does really truly look like something that maybe an artist has done and painted on the leaf itself. So it, it really is quite striking in the way that it kind of presents itself within the leaf. And as far as I'm aware, there's not an awful lot of plants that will do that with consistency. Obviously, I know there's a lot of variegated plants out there that sometimes the variegation comes in and it does almost look like a brush stroke. But this speckling, almost a brush stroke effect, I don't think I have ever seen on any other houseplants. If you have, and you know of a plant that's like that, I'd be really interested to know, as I'm assuming a lot of people in this video might be, do drop a comment down below. But yeah, essentially, it was a bit of love at first sight. And the stem itself and the new leaf when it comes out is really quite red, peachy, kind of pinkish as well. So if you're really into that kind of coloration, this plant does kind of tick those boxes really. But 
yeah, I managed to pick it up from the plant store. And interestingly enough, many, many years later, one of my planty friends in the area, I think I was meeting up with her at a local garden center, which I may have kind of mentioned in different videos, local to the area that I live within the UK, that does occasionally get some of the rarer house plants. And we were going there and I needed to go to the garden center because I think I needed to get some liquid gold leaf. But I kind of took her a cutting, I think it might have been a begonia brivirimosa, because I promised her a cutting essentially, and that plant for me, just the cuttings, I've got a whole propagation box which I'm pointing out, you can't see, it's off screen, but yeah, it is it is there. So I gave her one of the cuttings and we went in together, I was looking for other bits, she kind of saw they had a painted lady, a small painted lady, probably only about three or four leaves, it was a decent price for it as well. And she had exactly the same reaction that I did. And she was just like, oh, I never really considered this plant. This actually looks really good. And she ended up leaving with that plant. So I think it is that big thing with this plant. And I've heard people say this over and over again. And obviously, as with most plants, it's not going to be for everybody. But there's a lot more people that come around to this plant after they see it in person. When you look at the speed of growth for this plant, it's an interesting one because I have grown it from a very small plantlet and hopefully in the previous section I was able to add a picture somewhere that showed the plant when I first got it. I do think I've got it on my plant care app somewhere, but I have grown it. It's probably been, and the, the video title will have the um, how long I've had this plant, but I think it's been at least two or three years that I've had this plant like this. This is one of my slightly older plants. And it did take a while to get going. And that is been my experience with this plant is that it isn't the fastest growing philodendron. It kind of makes sense because of that patterning and because of that variegation that happens on the leaf to the extent that it happens. Because it doesn't necessarily seem like an awful lot when you're looking at that kind of brush stroke effect on the leaves. But it does mean that quite a large chunk of most leaves is variegated and thus not able to photosynthesize. So of course it makes sense that it would be a slightly slower growing philodendron because when people look at plants like this, they don't always necessarily assume variegation because when you buy a variegated plant, you know that it's going to be a bit slower than the fully green version of that plant. And I think, I'm not entirely sure, but based on how it's growing and I'm pointing down to it because that's where the mother plant is, but hopefully I'll be inserting clips throughout this video. But if I'm not mistaken, this probably has got some very strong links to the philodendron erubescence, I think it is, because the way that it grows, the stems, the petioles, the leaves are very kind of reminiscent. And a lot of plants tend to riff off that to a certain point, essentially. So I might be wrong. If you do know any different, do correct me in the comments down below. I'm, at any given time with my videos, I am more than happy to be corrected. If you know that I am talking rubbish, tell me that I'm talking rubbish, but also tell me why I'm talking rubbish. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, very, very slow plant. For me, no, I'm not actually saying that. I think I'm probably being a bit cruel on the plant. It's not the slowest growing philodendron that I have. It's definitely not the fastest growing philodendron that I have. But if you're really, really impatient, this might not be one for you. Ease of propagation with this plant is an interesting one because I've propagated it a couple of times. I don't actually have any of the propagates. I haven't propagated it recently. I propagated a while back and I'm pretty sure nearly all the propagates took. They, they rooted out quite beautifully and they've all been given to kind of friends really. So I don't have any propagates currently to show you. But I think the two cuttings that I took, one I did in perlite and it worked really well. So perlite would work well for it. I'm assuming the same way that it worked with perlite, it would probably work with pond. I've not had a lot of issues generally trying to root out most philodendron cuttings in pond. So I would say this one would be a good bet. And the other one was in damp sphagnum moss. Both rooted out beautifully. Similar to the pedatum with this one, it did root quickly, but it did take a while for it to start growing actively after it rooted in. And to be fair, most plants will do that to a certain point. So they might take a beat to root out, but they may take a longer beat to then start pushing leaves out because obviously the plant is trying, the, that new plant that is from the cutting is trying to establish itself in 
whatever growing media you've got it in in order for it to have that energy to pull it through. The other thing that I found really worked well with this is, as I do with most of my propagations actually, is for the first month or two when I'm trying to let it root out, especially when I'm starting to see some of those aerial roots potentially turn into the new media or soil roots, and I won't fertilize. So at that point, I will only give it water, just standard tap water. I've said this in previous videos, very few of my plants actually get reverse osmosis water. I think I exclusively use that now for my terrarium, mainly because I don't want salt buildup, and my carnivorous plants. But the thing that I will say is after that initial period, when you start seeing on this plant specifically, and actually to be fair, most of them, uh, after you've seen that initial root, I don't think it would be the equivalent of a tap root, but in my head, that kind of makes sense. So it's that main root that will probably anchor it to a certain point as well. When it starts getting the secondary little rootlets, essentially, that come off that main thicker root that usually not always, usually will be from that initial aerial route from the node. That At that point, again, I will give it a couple of weeks so those secondary routes get a bit longer. And then I will slowly start introducing very, very weak fertilizer. And I have found when doing this, that's the fastest way that I've been able to get most of my plants that have been from cutting and might take a while to start pushing out growth after they've rooted to start pushing out growth a bit faster. Don't do it too early because there is a risk that you might get some kind of chemical burning that might happen because that main root isn't, I find at least in my experience, isn't as good as kind of absorbing those nutrients as it might be and it's still trying to establish itself. So by the time it starts bringing out those secondary rootlets, it's usually a bit more robust at that point. And I've tried it with doing that and without doing that. And generally I found that by doing that, I tend to see growth happening up above, not just down below where the roots are, a lot faster than not doing that at all and just constantly using just plain water. In terms of availability for this plant, and I did kind of allude to this in the very beginning of the video, I did manage to pick this up from a plant store. Not a garden center, but a plant store. Although I did mention that a few years later after I had bought it with my friend, she did find it in a garden center. Granted that garden center does carry some slightly rarer house plants, but she did find it on there. The one thing that I have seen that is consistent with this plant is because it's not a massively, massively hyped up plant, it is one of those plants that will generally only come out on the market occasionally. So price-wise, I would say when I bought it, it was mid to slightly higher double digits. It wasn't something that would necessarily break the bank. I think it is considerably cheaper now based on what I've seen. So closer to the mid double digits and a bit lower at the moment for a relatively decent sized plant. So when I got mine for that price, it was quite juvenile, small, and there was only a few leaves basically. So bear that in mind. And it also, again, it links into what we've kind of talked about in other review videos is if a plant is slightly slow, there is a point where the pricing will become lower as more people are maybe potentially looking for it. That does have a bit of a limitation if there's not a huge demand for it. But also the price will only go down so much if a plant is a bit of a slow grower. So. That kind of makes sense because whoever's growing that plant out, whether or not it be a plant nursery or an individual that's rooting out a cutting, it will take a certain number of weeks, possibly even months to get it to the point where it's kind of suitable for sale and shipment as well. So something to bear in mind. But generally speaking, yeah, it, it's not the hardest house plant to find in a plant store or even online. It won't be the most expensive plant that you buy, but it probably won't be necessarily the cheapest thing. And I know this is kind of a bit counterintuitive to what I was saying before, that it's better if you get to see this in person because you might not always have that chance. But yeah, it is good if you see it. I would almost hazard a bet that if you do see it in a store, you will consider very seriously purchasing that plant if you don't, basically. But 
Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about this section. Let's move on to the next one. Moving on to pests with this one. And actually, it's not a particularly badly pest-prone plant, at least in my experience. And plants that have got a similar morphology and a similar types of philodendrons I found can be pest magnets at time. I don't think I have ever had spider mites on this. Pretty sure I haven't had spider mites on this. I have had mealybugs on this, but... <laughs> Uh, the joys of mealybugs in this conservatory. At some point I might do a video about dealing with mealybugs, but at this particular moment in time everything I'm trying doesn't seem to be working. So I've tried predatory insects, I've tried spraying with alcohol and taking out with a, a cotton bud. That is a bit of a false economy with me because at the level of how many plants have now got mealybugs, it's not a full-blown infestation, but uh, I am staying on top of it, so it's, I don't think it's ever going to get to that level. But if I was to do the little Q-tip and rubbing alcohol method with all my plants, I might be here for a few weeks, basically. So I am trying to find other ways that I can do this. If you've had a good experience with mealybugs, I think what uh, plants, pots and whatnot, so Nikki, I think what she did is that she kind of dunked all of the plant, the entirety of the stems and the leaves, again this is only possible if you've got slightly smaller plants, into soapy water for a few hours to kind of essentially dry off the mealybugs and then kind of, I think she maybe even repotted them entirely. But don't quote me on that, I think I remember seeing a video like that from Nikki, I'm not entirely sure. But if you do have some good ideas do let me know, I'm always open to suggestions, especially when it comes to keeling, uh, keeling? Killing off Mealybugs. Words are difficult to parody on a Saturday morning. Um, but yeah, I think mealybugs are pretty much the only thing that I've really ever had on that thrips. Touch wood. I've never had on this. That's it. I think it literally is just mealybugs. Right, accessories for this plant, and again, hopefully if you saw the beginning of the video, <laughs> janky support sticks for the win. And there's a reason why I don't, and you might not always see this plant, you might see there's a bit of a gap behind me because I've had to remove three or four huge plants in order to get this out because it's right at the very end of this plant shelf here. And it's also leaning against one of these metal poles. And I think I've also got it tied up to the poles. <laughs> A proper plant parent, and I say this jokingly as well at the same time, would probably chop and prop this plant so it can kind of grow a bit nicer and less leggy and all of the above and it doesn't reach the ceiling. I'm inherently a bit lazy when I've got this many plants. I'm even more lazy, so... I like the look of it. It's fine. It's, it's a bit more reminiscent of a real jungle. Real jungle plants in their environment don't look pristine, so please don't at me. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm comfortable with this, I'm not saying that anybody else should be. But uh, yeah, so janky support sticks. I have found my light airy arrowed soil mix to work really well with this. As I said, I think it would do okay in pon as well. Uh, and I do have it in a net pot. But other than that, yes, obviously you can put it on a moss pole and you can probably put it on a plank as well and it will do really well. Most philodendrons generally will, at least not ones that, the ones that generally would want to climb rather than the ones that tend to scramble. But it's not a very fussy plant and it's not a very fussy philodendron either. So that's, in my opinion, a very, very good thing about this plant is that it's relatively easy going. In terms of the care that I give for this plant, however, it is sitting quite high on a, sh on a plant shelf. So it's getting bright and direct light towards a bit brighter than most people would have assumed. And it's doing fine. This doesn't burn as easily as my Pedatum. And my Pedatum, and I've got another review for that one, I'll link it at the top there. But the Pedatum did get some crisping when we had the really, really blisteringly hot heat wave. We are currently in another heat wave, not quite as blisteringly hot at the moment. So if you see me sweltering, that would be why. Because currently in the conservatory, let me look at the thermometer. Oh, it's not too bad yet. It's 28 degrees Celsius. But I am sure it will get a lot warmer still. So, yeah. But uh, that plant, the pedatum, and again I'm pointing at it because I've had to bring that down as well to get the painted lady down as well. 
that one did get some crisping and if you see that video you'll see some of the crisping I've put in some b-roll where you can actually see some of that crisping that's happened on the leaves. This one hasn't really taken a beat. The leaves haven't burned in any way or form. It just kept on trucking on basically. And in terms of fertilizing with this, as with most of my plants actually, every second watering in the summer it gets fertilized and every third or fourth watering in the winter it gets fertilized. But yeah, that's everything I wanted to say I think for accessories. Let's go on to the next topic. So final thoughts for this plant, and you might have already guessed how this is going to fare. But let's start like I usually do, knowing what I know now, and if I didn't have this plant, would I get this plant? Surprisingly, maybe. I do like this plant. It doesn't a lot more than when I see it on pictures, so I'm quite glad I have owned it. It doesn't really set my world on fire. So you might be able to see some of the larger leaves are do get a, a, a lot more substantial than the smaller leaves and they get the lobing that you might get on the arabescence. But the problem with any philodendron that's very reminiscent of the arabescence, unless it's so drastically different, they all look... oh, people aren't gonna like this. They all look a bit samey to me. So, and granted I do know that the philodendron dark lore that I have I think it's also heavily linked to the arabescence. That one to me is a bit more interesting because I can get excited as the leaf transitions through all of its life stages when it's first unfurling, the coloration, and when it hardens off as well. And it feels kind of unique and special. The, the speckling is beautiful on this plant, but I mean, it, it, that's, this is gonna sound horrible. It's a bit like a one trick pony. That's why I say maybe I would still probably get this plant if I, when I was getting this plant, if I had quite as many plants and I had to take care of quite as many plants and I'm a lot more conscious now when I get plants that I really, really need to like them and I need to, and it, they need to be in here for the long haul, I probably wouldn't get this plant. If I was starting off like I was when I got this plant and I didn't have quite so many plants to care for, then yes, I would probably get it still. So mm, clear as mud. <laughs> but in terms of a score with this again, zero being the worst, zero one being the worst, ten being the best, how would I score this? Probably a six or a seven maybe. As a general house plant, as a philodendron, it would probably be about the same score maybe. It probably lean more towards a six but again it's just because it doesn't set my world on fire. It doesn't negate what I've said throughout this video and in the beginning it is still very striking when you see it in person. So do with that what you will, but hopefully if you've had this plant, I would love to hear your opinion, especially if you've had it for quite a long time. Does it still excite you a lot, basically? Because it might just be me. It might just be me. I'm always kind of in these videos, these are my opinions, so yours might differ drastically sometimes as well, based on some of the comments that I'm seeing. But yeah. I think that's everything I wanted to say about the Painted Lady. Definitely still, for me, a very underrated philodendron and maybe one to consider adding to your collection, especially if you are starting to get into the slightly harder and more difficult plants to find to add to your collection. But yeah, as always, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.